as I have you all together, all my studies are collapsing onto me now because I tried to spend the night familiarizing myself with your work. Mm -hmm. I think it worked a little bit, or at, at least uh, enough to, to have an idea in what direction I would like to go. Um, we cannot touch the science aspects of your respective fields too deeply, but your fields relate to each other the way I understand it very much, and they relate very much to the big field of survival on this planet, uh, not only for us, but other species as well, if I may say so. So uh, what I would like to do, starting left, it's like around, around, I have some set, very simple, almost banal, primitive questions <laughs> that I'd like to ask. Um, and I, I ask you and then maybe you can answer once in a round. And the answer, the answer, the answer is, um, the question is what inspired you to become active in your respective field and line of work? Oh. And what is it? Because, you know, what is it that you actually do? Okay. Well, my main focus of my work is to stop extinctions. I, uh, from the time I was really young, I spent a lot of my free time playing in the rivers and the lakes around Telluride growing up here and developed a really strong appreciation for natural ecosystems and the animals that live in them. Um, I also have a sort of philosophical point of view that there's a morality issue around extinctions and human-caused extinctions. You mean we could have a responsibility, is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. And yeah. Okay. And specifically, what is it now that specifically you're engaged in? Now I'm focusing on protecting freshwater species from extinction because they are going extinct faster than any other group of species. So if you want to make a large global impact on the rate of extinctions, focusing on the species that are going extinct the fastest has the best potential. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we will, and I say that now for all the people that are listening, all the specifics of the institutions that you're working with and nonprofits that you're working with and that you're supporting, we will provide that information. So we don't have to put that out now. This will be, will be there in writing. Thank you. What has inspired you? What has brought you to what, what you're doing now and what is it? You know, I, I sort of grew up in a social justice oriented house. My, uh, Parents, my father was a labor union organizer back in the 50s. He um, and my mom joined the Peace Corps in the first year it was started. Uh, so I spent my early childhood in Bolivia. Um, he worked a lot with Cesar Chavez and that whole sort of Chicano rights and uh, labor union movement in California. And um, so I didn't, it never, it, it never occurred to me to not work on making the world a better place. That's just sort of the values of my family. Um, and I think I saw, you know, the, the rest of the species on the planet as kind of the ultimate underdog, the ultimate oppressed group. Um, and I also had this kind of affinity, this personal connection to nature. Uh, so the kind of two things came together. And although I tried hard at different stages to be just like a pure scientist, because I, I had that bent, I loved science, um, I was always sort of drawn back to actually the more kind of on the ground uh, conservation work. And and the hands on stuff, I mean, I have to say, I've seen you with pretty big fish, which <laughs> the pluralist fish, yeah. yes. <laughs> and I've seen you with pretty big fish. You, But you are in the salt water as well. Is that correct? Is that a distinction? Is that well, I did say that maybe the. I've been focused on um, protecting species or preventing extinctions in the places where you can get the most done uh, the most effectively. And so like 89% of all extinctions have happened in less than 3% of the Earth's surface. So it's islands, which are about 2% of the Earth's surface, and freshwater systems, which are just a little bit under 1% of the Earth's surface. That's where 89% of all extinctions have occurred. So I've concentrated in both those areas, first on islands and now more recently with freshwaters working with Harmony. Thank you. That's already a few numbers that are uh, making me a little shiver. Uh, <laughs> thank you. We'll, we shall return to that. Erica, what what's you think? You're not in the water so much. Um, you're more on Earth. <laughs> on, on, what's, what's, what's your thing and what got you to what you're doing? Yeah, so... Um 
I'm a professor at the University of California, and um, I love that role because part of what I do is research and sort of building our understanding of what the implications are of losing biological diversity, how biodiversity holds natural systems together and supports people's livelihoods and people's well-being. And part of what I get to do is also to cultivate those relationships through teaching and through, you know, improving the way that we do education and higher education around um, biology, around ecology and the environment. And I think, you know, how I got to this place is that I grew up in a big city um, without a lot of nature um, available. And um, so I came to value it a lot personally. But then also as I... Um, you know, branched out and was able to see more of the world as I got older, um, became really fascinated actually by the relationships that people have in different parts of the world and in different ways with the places they live, with the animals they depend on, um, with the forests that they, you know, that surround their homes and so on, and, and um, became first really interested actually in the anthropology of those relationships, of relationships between people and places and wildlife um, and in what a fundamental role those relationships play in our understanding of who we are as people. So, um, you know, my work has evolved since to focus much more on how to protect both the biodiversity involved and those relationships. Because although I guess some people disagree, but we are animals. I mean, do we agree here on the table that, I mean, we may be very bright animals, but do are we animals? As human beings, we're species yeah, of animals. Yeah, no, I'm. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, I, we're extraordinary. We come animals. from the, we <laughs> traveled here from the <laughs> yeah. Midwest. It's not, you know, sorry, but it's, it's not, yeah, so let's establish that. Thank you. I would like to ask you, because you've started, you've, you've given a few numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like, maybe how many are you starting and let's, let's keep this going like that, or uh, mm -hmm. if there's some, somebody wants to interrupt, interrupt. But um, give me a few numbers where we are at. I recently had a conversation with an ecologist. Um, from from an Eastern University, I've forgotten. He's doing a project along the European Green Belt, uh, and we were talking about extinction events that have taken place on this mm -hmm. planet already. I think mm -hmm. it's six or five. I mean, mm -hmm. there is debate about it, but some of them going to almost ninety percent of the species. Mm -hmm. So extinction itself is nothing strange to the planet. I just want to work out, uh, you know, what is this responsibilities of ours, and why should we feel it and not just mm -hmm. say, you know. That's something that happens a lot. Where are we at? What out of your field perspective is, is numbers where you'd say like, okay, that's why we should do something. Mm. Uh, well, there was a recent report that came out by uh, WWF where they showed about 70% decline, I believe, in uh, vertebrate populations around the world. Um, so yeah, that's a lot of species that we lost. 70%. Yeah. For the and people that vertebrae are the ones with spines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Do you have some numbers uh, to throw around th that make people think? Incidentally, all of those numbers, I'm just saying this, can be followed up. Yeah. That's yeah. The you know, the, the <clears throat> for me, um, the story is not really about how many species we've lost to extinction um, because the number of species that we've actually lost isn't that great. Erica can probably remember the numbers. I analyzed the data to figure it out, but you know, can't remember those things without them in front of me. Um, but if we look, think about how many species we've lost, it might be something like one to like 0.1 to point to like half a percent of you know different taxonomic groups, different types of of animals and plants. Um, but it's the number that we could lose, right? Which is more like, depending on how you look at it, sort of five to 10% potentially of different taxonomic groups or one to, one to 10% of some different types of plants, animals in our, in our lifetimes. Um, and, you know, a thousand years from now, 2000 years from now, 10,000 years ago from now when climate change is like a distant memory when you know because like we've either resolved that or we haven't right when the current political configuration of europe and the united states and you know the entire world is just 
like like Roman history, you know, it's just a thing of the past. The lasting legacy of our era will be the species we've lost. Because those species, a million years from now, five million years from now, 20 million years from now, will still be able to detect their absence. Because that's how long it takes for them, you know, for new species to evolve. So, so carbon pollution, climate change, greenhouse gases, you're talking about impacts that are going to last tens to you know hundreds of years and at that then they'll be out of the atmosphere it'll return to normal right but the extinctions you're talking about impacts that last million you know like low millions to to many tens of millions of years thank you those are that's interesting i've never thought of it like that uh and of course when i say throw numbers around that's <coughs> just a metaphor yeah, yeah? yeah thank you thank you that's do you have something to add to the discomforting reality <laughs> on this table <laughs> i mean i think those are those are really really um accurate portrayals of where we are and two things that i would add one is that we're not losing things sort of at random now I think in the past, you know, when we've had extinction events that had to do with like an asteroid hitting the Earth from outer space, um, you know, the one that landed in the Gulf of Mexico that just sort of blew out a whole bunch of stuff across the spectrum of animals and plants and um, it just did in anything that was nearby and anything that couldn't handle it getting cold like that or dark. Um, what we're doing now is really different. Um, what's going extinct now are the things that people harvest and people want to be able to um, do things with the same rare freshwater systems or hyperdiverse forests that those species inhabit. And um, a lot of what's happening is specifically targeted at, at species that, you know, that play really important roles in the systems that they live in. So it's not like a random process this time. We're selectively getting rid of species that are really valuable from all kinds of perspectives and then aiding in the spread and the proliferation of things like weeds and rats and you know diseases um, it's a very particular kind of shift it's not one that's for the better for people or otherwise the other thing though that I want to make sure we don't lose sight of is that there was a report released last year that you know we're sort of in imminent danger of losing a million species on the order of a million species on earth from the groups that we understand, like the vertebrates and the plants, um, which I think causes a lot of sense of hopelessness. And it's really, to me, important to also um, pinpoint the fact that there have only been, you know, on the order of a thousand things that we've lost that we know of from those groups. And that if you look at what's really in imminent danger, it's a much smaller number. It's between five and 10,000 species. That's a number we can do something about. Um, and stopping biodiversity loss is different from stopping climate change. Everyone has to row, row together to stop climate change. Stopping biodiversity loss, preventing extinctions, you know, Harmony and Bernie can stop a whole bunch of extinctions through their work in targeted freshwater systems. There are efforts all around the world that are going to prevent extinctions. So, and there are a lot of examples already of species that have gone extinct in the wild, like the California condor, and now they are back in the wild. So, you know, we know that success is possible and that it can happen, you know, at a local level. It's not just an all or nothing kind of issue. And so I really want to focus on um, the possibility of preventing an extinction crisis, a mass extinction. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that hopeful, <laughs> for hopeful intervention. Uh, I want to ask you now, for people who are not in the field in any of this, uh, it is overwhelming. Yes. Because, you know, we have now Extinction Rebellion in Europe, mm -hmm. that people are going really nuts. They're gluing themselves to public transport, which is not working because by doing that, they antagonize the yeah. rest of the population and uh -huh. so on and so forth. People who are totally overwrought, the farmers in Austria, that where I know it, saying, okay, what's next? You know, yeah. now, now we are horrible okay. species. Uh, let's stay with this hope theme and maybe you could um, elaborate a little bit on your work that you do where Erica says you can actually do something. What are you, how are you saving? How are you, how are you working on, on, yeah, on hope? 
Yeah, I think it's really important to keep that perspective because when we see a lot of the media about extinction and biodiversity loss, it tends to be these doom and gloom stories, which then I think reduce people's uh, drive to take action. Um, So for us, focusing on freshwater species has a really high potential to affect the extinctions of a wide range and a high number of let's, species. Let's again, sorry, let's again define freshwater, just to, that it's really clear. So freshwater would work? include rivers, lakes, wetlands, um, sometimes the estuarine areas could be, they're not totally fresh, but they're a mix of salt and freshwater. So those type of habitats. Yeah. And what do you do there? <laughs> <laughs> well, with freshwater life, we're focusing on protecting native endangered species that are threatened and declining because of introduced invasive species. And for modern day extinctions of freshwater species, for about 41% of those extinctions, invasive species have been at least partially the cause of those extinctions. That means into an ecosystem, a species is introduced that has never been there. Mm -hmm. Like Australia, the rabbits, not freshwater, but yeah, yeah, rabbits in Australia. Okay, carps, I I hear carp is, yeah, carp, 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 we would think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a big one. So what do you do? Because you're working, I think, uh, would you say it again, the, the, the organizations, it's... Freshwater Life. Freshwater Life is yeah. an organization, non-profit. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what, what is happening on the ground there? No? <laughs> Do you want to go ahead? Sure. <laughs> um, well, you know, what's happened all over the world is that species have moved, have been brought by people from one ecosystem to another, from one continent to another, from a continent to an island. And when they get there, the... Um, the native ecosystems and species they're just not adapted in any way right so the species get in and they they eat or out compete or spread diseases um to native species or they completely destroy the habitats right and um it's happened a ton on islands and and i just say that this is the largest cause of extinction it's a bigger cause of extinction in habitat use it's a bigger cause of extinction in pollution it's a bigger cause of extinction than overhunting or overexploitation. The biggest single cause of extinction has been invasive species or introduced species, right? It's a complicated issue. It's difficult to manage in a lot of settings, but on islands and in some fresh and some small freshwater settings, they're contained enough that you can just remove all the invasive species, and then put the native species back and they can flourish. There have been like incredible recoveries, remarkable recoveries um, by removing invasive species. And so that's what freshwater life focuses on is finding those settings in freshwater systems where the introduced fish can be removed and these critically endangered native species of birds, frogs, fish, turtles, crayfish, dragonflies, things like that, can then flourish. Thank you. Let me, that, that's actually an but interesting. If I, if I yeah. just could go on. Please do. These, like Erica talked about hope, and these sorts of successes, like, okay, freshwater life has, this, has its thing that it does. It's really important. We can save a lot of species, right? But there are other organizations doing similar work all over the world, having incredible successes saving species from extinction. There are tons of success stories all over the place, but especially in wealthy countries. And now what we need to do is figure out how to kind of replicate those stories. And a lot of them are about as simple as what Freshwater Life is doing. I think it would be interesting to later on maybe create best practice examples yeah. or maybe give examples of those that we can share with, with people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there's a bridge that's just been built that I haven't thought about. Um, we started off saying we're also animals. Um, you have a background in anthropology, um, as far as I, I remember from your studies in Stanford. Now, and evolutionary biology. Now, evolution 
in my understanding, has always had something to do with the place where things evolve, but also with stuff that comes from the outside. So there's always mm -hmm. been a fluctuation, the way I understand mm -hmm. it. Now I ask you, when is too much too much? What is, you know, what has happened now? I see it down on the reservation with certain weeds and it's yeah. the Russian something, Russian bang, something. Yeah. yeah, and then everything else is gone. Was that not always so? Why is that suddenly such an imminent danger? Should we not leave it to nature? Is that not in nature anymore? Where's the borderline? When does mm. it become too mm. much? Mm -hmm. um, uh, when is it not any longer friendly migration, um, but invasion? Right. Um, so much of the world's biodiversity has evolved on land, at least, and in freshwater systems, sort of over the last couple of hundred millions of years, we went from one big continent to several continents separated by oceans. And in that period, there was this explosion of the evolution of new biodiversity because of those oceans between the continents. So, um, you know, prior to that stuff could move all over Pangaea, um, but we've, we've, we've had this period during which you know, the Americas evolved uh, distinct fauna and plants and so on from Eurasia and so on. And I think that the, the time scale is important because that process has taken hundreds of millions of years. And the time scale on which we are now moving stuff like crazy on ships, on airplanes, on purpose sometimes, you know, I want pet whatever, exotic parrots, and then whoops, I let them go out my window in San Francisco. And, you know, that one happens not to really matter very much, but, you know, it could e equally easily be, um, you know, the, the sparrows that, somebody brought over and put in Central Park in New York and now they're all over North America and uh, um, making it really difficult for a lot of the species that eat those same diets, that occupy those same habitats to, to continue to exist. So the time scale on which we're moving things around is, you know, it's literally hundreds of millions of times too fast for evolution to respond to. Um, and so, so the rate really matters. I think the other piece about this is that, it, for me, it's often helpful to think about disease because um, people are familiar with what it means for, for instance, um, you know, Ebola to jump across an ocean, which now can happen because of all of the transport and everything. And um, it's not, um, what do I want to say here? <laughs> When you move one thing without the ecosystem of other organisms that interact with it, so all of the natural enemies of that one thing that you've moved, all of the natural sort of checks and balances don't come with, and um, there's the potential for this really explosive spread that you would not see happen if the movement were more like, you know, a raft of logs coming over from <laughs> the mouth of a river to an yeah. island with a whole bunch of different stuff on it. Thank you. That, I think that's an, uh, important. So the time factor is huge. Would you want to add to that? Is there, is there an aspect uh, why things become too much so, so quickly nowadays? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, Erica talked about that time factor. You know, so all these introductions that we're talking about have really happened kind of since the age of exploration, right? Like 17, 1600, 1700, maybe going back to maybe 1400. But the vast majority of them have been like in the last hundred years, mm. essentially. Right? Whereas Eric is talking about these natural colonizations that take place over millions of years. Um, and then they're also happening in, the, in a context in which we're having all these other perturbations, all these other impacts on the world. Um, and the invasive species are a simple one that are oftentimes quite simple to deal with um, and we can you know so we can like we can solve that threat to a lot of species on islands in freshwater systems and then um, work on some of the more complex issues like deforestation right climate change right those sorts of things. Let's 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 <clears throat> let's make the jump. So you say an invasive species. I I see, I see it. Mm -hmm. This snake is here. It shouldn't be here. Yeah. I try to hunt them all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going well in Florida, but but I mean, it's yeah. possible. It's possible. Right. We can extract it, but that's not 
in a way that's only one point and it's maybe not the biggest point. So there's other stuff going on around us. Yes, it's only one point, but it actually is the biggest point, the invasive species. Um, and it's, you know, it's a tractable one, right? But if you look at, if you look at what's happening now, and this is, you know, where I look at cause for hope, right? Like we're sitting in this room and tell you, right, you could tell the same story about Austria, Czechoslovakia, or almost anywhere in Europe. But if you look out here and tell you, right, there are more trees, right? There's more wildlife. The air is cleaner than any time in the last hundred years. That same, yeah. that same thing is happening all over Europe. You guys now have wolves in every big European country. You have grizzly bears, or brown bears, you call them. Brown bears in Italy, in Switzerland, in France. You know, like, they're all over the place now. There was a brown bear recently in Germany, mm -hmm. right? That kind of recovery is happening all over the place in the rich countries of the world. And it's starting to happen in the middle income countries as well. When people kind of like easing up that pressure on nature, there's been, you know, just incredible conservation successes. Let's run with that. How many, because you brought in this ethical, moral aspect. Um, I've been teaching not 25 years something on the reservation. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it originally was a bit of the legend of the natural man, you know, mm -hmm. that I grew up with through literature was part of that interest. Yeah. Uh, now, I have come to understand that never actually existed in that sense. There's never been, or maybe I'm wrong, a state of humanity that was in, in real balance with nature, but maybe I'm wrong. The question for me now is, okay, we have this moral, moral obligation. What, how would you see humanity, people on the whole, change? What is changing um, that, we, that we become aware of those things? Because throughout the whole Industrial Revolution, it was, you know, those were enemies or we didn't care about it. Mm -hmm. What is happening or what could we do to facilitate a change towards that ideal I think we're all kind of speaking of an ideal where we as a species find our place and we develop with all the other species mm -hmm. happily ever after. What's what's going on there? Is, it, is there new generations coming that have a different attitude? Um, is this a flash in the pan? Is, is humanity changing? Well, it does seem to me that the newer generations do have a much larger sense of their potential impact and the responsibility that comes along with that. Um, I think exposure to nature and wildlife is extremely important to help people develop the appreciation. Um, and I think that's something that there's more and more research coming out about uh, what a positive impact time in national parks or forests can have on people's well-being. Um, there's also a lot of evidence showing how much benefit humans get from biodiversity. Um, so ecosystem services, these kind of things like water filtration and pollination of, of fruit, fruiting plants. And um, so, you know, that's one way, I think, to frame the idea um, that we are truly dependent right we didn't maybe quite understand what the bees were doing so yeah. <laughs> okay all right yeah would you agree is did you see yeah <laughs> oh come on <laughs> <laughs> what i see is you know if you if you look at history and how attitudes have changed over time attitudes towards people Right. Like it's now just it's just accepted that we should improve the lot of people. It's accepted that people shouldn't be dying of preventable diseases. We don't we you know, it's accepted that children and especially young girls should and especially girls should be educated even in the poorest parts of the world. It's accepted that we should try to reduce child mortality and try to reduce maternal uh, mortality. And these are just like now values that are widely held amongst people all over the world. 
And <clears throat> that's made the world a way better place. And we struggle, right? We struggle with equity. We struggle with racism. We struggle with um, inter-ethnic violence, of course. But there's Compared progress. Compared to what was right. going on. There's progress. There's ongoing progress, right? And in the same way that slavery has become unacceptable and now the idea of like and that has sort of that that these these values around slavery bit being unacceptable have transferred into these values of also um discrimination against homosexuals or against transgender people are now becoming inaccept i'm are becoming unacceptable right that unacceptable that that same sort of those values are starting to extend to the natural world in a way that, at least in the Western world, they haven't. And so people in Europe are questioning. It's not just this given that, oh my God, there's a brown bear, we should kill it to protect ourselves. It's more like, okay, how can we coexist with this brown bear? How can we coexist with these wolves, right? We're dealing with Cal in the, the same sort of issues in the United States, and there's a shift Right? There's a there's a moral a value shift that, that is happening worldwide, and you combine that shift with these sort of pragmatic, down in the weeds tools that like Harmony is using to save species that people are using to to protect habitats, and those two things can come together and be a real force for progress. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> are you <laughs> are you as Positive and optimistic. Absolutely. I mean, I think as long as it's possible for us to um, turn the tide on this, then we have to be hopeful and we have to work as hard as we can to achieve those ends. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things in the United States, especially that we've all gotten used to is this framing of the environment and conservation and protecting wildlife as being somehow in opposition to people's well-being. Um, that really emerged strongly sort of in my childhood, you know, in the 80s, I think was sort of mm -hmm. the peak of that framing. It was a political framing that you've got to choose, you know, it's owls or loggers, it's you get to pick. Um, and I think we've moved past that, you know, maybe not all of us, but I think as uh, certainly internationally, people have moved past that or they never went there in the first place. So I also feel really optimistic about um, this growing understanding that people's well-being and the well-being of the rest of life on Earth is totally intertwined. And you see that in all kinds of ways. You know, there are these very sort of utilitarian, pragmatic ways that they're intertwined, like the pollination of the crops that feed the world it has to do with, you know, the quality of the environment and with the biodiversity that coexists with us. But then in these other ways, um, people who are sitting in a hospital bed who have trees outside their window, they recover faster than people who are sitting in a hospital bed and have a wall outside their window or a street. So in these very profound ways, people's well-being is tied to nature. And I think that's the emergent paradigm now that, that more and more people, most of us, accept mm -hmm. and live with. So it's not one versus the other. It's like, you know, we're all going to sink or swim together. Mm -hmm. So... Um, if you are really interested in humanitarian causes, then it goes in lockstep with um, conserving biodiversity. Oh, you almost got away with having uh, uncontroversial, beautiful word at the end. But oh, no. now you did it. Uh -oh. I was in my mind going like, am I going to go to human migration or not? But I will. Mm -hmm. You said it goes lock and st you said it goes together. And I one of one of the big, big issues that, that I never thought in my lifetime would come to play such a huge role in the world, again, I would say, uh, and on my mind is migration mm -hmm. of our species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and being Austrian, and, and, it, and Austria has an interesting history, as you know, where science um, played a role, and, and a very controversial one. Um, I was thinking, should I ask scientists that? But I will do it now, because yeah. you made the, made the correlation. Mm -hmm. I have my 
migratory background. Just I was joking on the phone, you know, Croatian, yeah. Czech. Um, so Austrians itself are made up of several mm -hmm. groups of people. You have migratory background in the sense that I think both your parents were not born in, in the mm -hmm. US. I think uh, you also have a uh, migratory background, but dear, in the yeah. generational sense. With you, I'm not sure, but sure. Three generations ago, you were Swedish or something <laughs> like this. Um, we're here in the US. We went down to the border. We, we took a picture of the wall. Uh, we have a big discussion in Europe. What do you mean discussion? The Fortress yeah. Europe is a discussion. So there's a relationship between that. Um, how, how do you see this migration? Is everything that we have said now true also for humans? We talked about time scale. Is there something we can learn? I, this is right. really tricky, but I want to ask. No, you it's, it's a super important question. Do you want to, Eric and I talk about this I want, a lot. I would like yeah. everybody yeah. to talk about that because, you know, there's something that we can learn if we, you know, I don't yeah. have to say it. Well, I think, okay. The first thing I would say is that um, we're all one species. So I know that there are conversations that arise around this parallel between immigration and invasive species. And um, it's, not a, it's not a good comparison, right? People are all people. So, I mean, the history of the world is a history of migration of people. Um, and that is a different issue from, you know, new species, diseases of people moving across continental boundaries. So I want to make sure that gets said. So we, sorry, let us repeat that. Yeah. We're talking invasive species, species versus species. But as humans are one species, yes. separated from our next primate ancestors by a jo laughable uh, genetic uh, code difference but we are one species so yes. we don't we separate those issues thank you continue That's yeah and maybe maybe just to re-emphasize that you know the history of human history is a history of migration so you know you don't have to look back very long at all to see major movements that have taken place like big movements just in the on the scale of hundreds of years many of them all over the world. That is the history of our species. And it's kind of um, an amazing feature of what we are as a species that we can move around and adapt to new settings really, really quickly. Okay, so that's sort of a biologist, biologist perspective on that. Um, you know, it, it, with respect to this political conversation that's going on, um, a really important question to be asking is well, why are people moving? And, um, it, you know, I don't want to dive into politics, but it so often people are moving because um, the situations that they are living in are untenable and those often, often have environmental roots. So, um, you know, if you look at the history of conflict and of migrations globally, um, probably the most, the most common instigator of those conflicts and those movements is, is a resource shortage. People need fish and you know, there aren't fish or there are fish, but the fish are not being shared equally. So there, there are equity issues around access to resources and there are absolute issues about the quality of resources that drive so much of that. So, um, you know, as somebody who works in ecology and cares about conservation, so much of that is out of concern for the well-being of people who are living in places where um, resource shortages and environmental degradation um, are forcing people to have to fight or move. The, um, there's papers, there's, there's research showing a, a link between drought in communities in Mexico and migration from those communities to the United States. And in Syria as well, sorry. Yeah, over the, over and the that world. same thing is happening all over the yeah. world, right? So <clears throat> I'm working with, through the Malago Foundation, working with people in Myanmar, who like they don't even care about nature at this one level, right? What they care about is peace. But the way that they create peace and build peace is through fish and through trees. Because if people have enough fish to eat, they have enough trees for firewood, they have enough pasture for their cattle, then they don't need to fight between each other. Those fights between different ethnic groups are exacerbated by or, or almost, you know, driven by shortages of resources, right? So you build up the resources, then you can build a peace. The same thing happens with this migration, right? Like the best way to prevent a lot of migration to Europe 
is by building economies in the Sahal and South. And the best way to start that process is with reforestation, better management of pastures, right? And definitely, I mean, obviously part of it is poor, poor governments, right? People move for, for two, people move for all sorts of reasons, right? But when lots of people are fleeing an area, they're fleeing for one of two reasons. There aren't enough resources or there's a, a horrible kleptocratic uh, you know, jingoistic racist government, right? Those are really why people leave. But when their resources are good, it's much harder for bad governments to get in place and it's much harder for bad governments to turn people against each other, right? And so, like, when I look at how to... Migration is a wonderful thing. It's part of what we do. Erica talked about that. But people should be free to choose to migrate. They shouldn't be forced to flee countries. The way to keep people from fleeing countries starts with good conservation management of natural resources, fish, pastures, trees, farmland. Water. Water. Final word. But I want to do a quick round because you were talking about now eco-management mm -hmm. as a basis for for economy for for solving those mega issues uh, and I want to break it down in the final round to our individual uh, behavior and responsibility uh, from your point of view as a scientist in your respective field what is the one thing or maybe two things or, um, that the individual anywhere in the world can do to support your work and by doing that support the solutions to the problems we've talked about off the top of your head <laughs> off the top of my head one of the important things that just uh, uh, anyone in the general public can do is to find really effective conservation organizations that are doing work on the ground, have proven solutions, and uh, have been effective and can take their tools to a large scale and supporting those organizations. Um, you know, thinking about your own resource use is also an important one. And um, I think also putting political pressure on leaders um, there, there's been environmental legislation passed, some of the most progressive environmental legislation in the U.S. was passed under the Nixon administration because there was so much pressure from the public to move this issue forward. So I think that's another thing that people could do. Thank you. I think about this stuff a lot and I'm super crit I think that the biggest scam has been perpetuated on the public around the environment is that you can shop your way out of the environmental crisis or that um, you can take individual actions and have an impact like buying a fuel efficient car or putting solar panels on your house now we have solar panels on our house I drive a fuel efficient car but that's more for moral reasons. I'm not trying to change the world that way. The best thing individuals can do is to vote for pro-conservation politicians, to donate money to pro-conservation con politicians and organizations. What you as an individual do is important in because it makes you feel good and it's doing the right thing it's kind of an expression of your values but the way you change the world is through politicians and through the big organizations that can implement or through the effective organizations that can implement conservation i agree i think that um we've come to think of ourselves in too literal of a way as animals as the sum of what we consume and produce as individuals and you know just like Bernie said I think consumer choice is sort of it's wrapped up in this idea that the most that we can do for this issue is to consume less that's an important piece but the way that as a as societies we consume less is through policy and our potential as individuals to save things from going extinct 
to change policy, you know, to radically sort of reshape the way that cultural norms look um, in our societies is not through um, whether we buy the brown or the white paper towels. It's through um, seeing ourselves as having more potential than that and being politically active and um, getting involved maybe with money, but also with our own work. You, mm. I mean, I think for, for the generation that's coming up now, the potential to be involved in shifting the course of history is enormous. It's enormous. And it's not going to be just through personal consumption. It's going to be through the creativity that people bring to solving these enormous problems and to convincing everyone around them to work on that too. I think that's, you know, we're facing these enormous, enormous challenges, climate change, and lots of extinctions and huge issues around inequity are, you know, they're sort of like the big issues of our time. And um, they're not going to get solved unless people feel like uh, they have the power to, to actually make a difference. And they totally do way above and beyond um, how many miles they fly this year. Thank you. you made me feel a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Harmony. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Bernie, so much. Uh, from my side, I've, I've again have to say one of the great things is swarm intelligence and, and listening to each other. Um, and I hope we stay in conversation and carry it further. Um, and and I, I walk away somewhat more optimistic, and I thank you for that. <laughs>